it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn is an adult neurologist uh, with a special interest in autonomic disorders and movement disorders. Her clinical focuses include uh, autonomic disorders such as uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, neurodegenerative disorders such as multiple systems atrophy, uh, the treatment of autonomic symptoms and complex neurological symptoms, uh, working with local care providers to optimize quality of life in patients with neurological disease, and testing of the autonomic nervous system. In addition to her clinical activities, uh, Dr. Kuhn is active in research and education. Her research centers on both autonomic and movement disorders, as well as the history of neurology. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Kuhn. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I'm really honored to be here today and, and excited to talk about multiple system atrophy. We are going to start by going over the history of multiple system atrophy. I think it is helpful to know um, where we got to where we were, uh, and especially some of the terminology, which in multiple system atrophy can be really complex. I will also break it down into the different types of multiple system atrophy, because we uh, are certainly interested in the cerebellar type because of the ataxia, but there's certainly some overlap too with the Parkinson's type or MSAP uh, to MSAC. We'll talk about that in the clinical section. And then we'll end by talking about the ways that we can care for patients with MSA. So on to the history. So when we look back into the history, some of the earliest cases of multiple system atrophy that we see reported are some of the notable ones uh, occurred in the early uh, 20th century. So Bradbury and Eggleston reported on a case of patients with orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension. And that's important because one of the key features in MSA is that patients have orthostatic hypotension or another um, clinical symptom of autonomic failure. And of these patients that Bradbury and Eggleston uh, reported on, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of them ended up having additional motor signs concerning for later development of what we now call multiple system atrophy. This uh, syndrome, bradbury Eggleston syndrome, then came to be known as the autonomic failure component of multiple system atrophy, and what we now call as pure autonomic failure, and we'll tie that into MSA throughout the talk. A really important uh, historical ardor, ardor, article was um, by Milton Shai and Glenn Drager, so in uh, the 1960s, there was a lot of interest in patients who had this autonomic failure or orthostatic hypotension, but also had the movement disorder. So either the ataxia or the Parkinsonism. And in the 1960s, there was a pathological account by another group, uh, Van der Ecken, Adams, and Van Bogart, with predominantly Parkinsonism, and they coined the term striatal palatal nigral degeneration, which comes up in the literature. Now, Shai and Drager reported four patients, and they described patients with this autonomic failure, blood pressure drop, also uh, one with Parkinsonism, and another with ataxia, or cerebellar ataxia. And so after this um, report and described some of the pathological features, we see this term shy drager syndrome enter the literature. Now, as I just described, the shy drager syndrome really describes what we think of as multiple system atrophy. But over time, it got enveloped into a, a bigger umbrella term that may not have, have fit. So um, clinicians or patients were using this shy drager term and talking about very different either pathologic or clinical entities. And so the, the term shy drager syndrome, even though it was very well described back in the 1960s, got to be a bit problematic in terms of uh, people talking about different things. And another important case around this time was in 1961 when Adams reported uh, a patient who had a, had a tremor, uh, had both Parkinsonism and cerebellar ataxia and really combine those motor features with a patient who had autonomic failure. And in this case, we see pathologically described as striatal nidal degeneration and olivopontocerebellar degeneration, describing more of the ataxia 
uh, anatomical features. So you can see there's a lot of confusion in the literature and a, and a number of different terms that are being thrown out. This paper then in the 1960s was by Graham and Oppenheimer, and they used this term, multiple system atrophy. And they united these three paths, that Bradbury Eggleston with the autonomic failure, the striatal nigral degeneration, the olivopontal cerebellar atrophy, uh, and, and the shy Drager term, and said, really, we therefore propose the term multiple system atrophy. And what they said, the reasoning for using this term is that the similarities between these syndromes, which had been described by different people, is obvious. And it would be unreasonable to attach different diagnostic labels to these cases. The disadvantage of this type of labeling is apparent from the fact that, that they have some combination with the naming from, especially in that Adams article I talked about. And what we wish to avoid is the multiplication of names for disease entities, which in fact are merely the expression of neuronal atrophy in a variety of overlapping combinations. And so that's gonna be a theme that I talk about is that in MSA, there is this overlap of combination in these specific themes that will come out uh, that really uh, helps characterize this disorder of MSA. From a historical standpoint, I love highlighting the contributions of Roger Bannister. Now, many people in the sports world know of Roger Bannister for breaking the four minute mile barrier in 1959. But he was a medical student at the time and later trained in neurology and pathology and did incredible neuropathologic studies, which gave us further information and helped define pathologically what multiple system atrophy uh, uh, kind of really is as a distinct entity. And kind of taking that separate from other types of similar disorders like dementia with Lewy bodies. And then the field really came together uh, with this consensus statement in 1998 that combined uh, some autonomic experts and movement experts like Sid Gilman and, and had this consensus statement on MSA. And I like how they term this need. It said the use of confusing terms such as multi-system degeneration, which was different, which was proposed by Graham and Oppenheimer, is inappropriate, should be discussed discouraged. And, and they also recommend using the different subtypes. So MSAP, if it's Parkinsonism, that's predominant, or MSAC for the cerebellar features, if that's predominant. And that really replaced these pathological terms, which were uh, a mouthful of striatal nigral degeneration or the olivopontal cerebellar atrophy. And then since shy Drager had been misused, that was really, uh, really no longer useful. And so this is when the, the field really um, anchored on this and it's been consistent since. I will say that we still see some clinicians using some of these older terms, but really wanna encourage that multiple system atrophy. And so uh, following that in uh, 2008, there was a redefinition of some of the criteria for multiple system atrophy and it established different tiers uh, for more likely uh, or definite, uh, which is pathologically confirmed, MSA. And then most recently, we have the Movement Disorder Society for the Diagnosis of Multiple System Atrophy, which has established a new criteria. So we have clinically established MSA, which if patients meet that, um, that criteria with the autonomic failure, which could be bladder uh, problems or orthostatic hypotension with either the Parkinsonism or the cerebellar syndrome versus clinically probable, meaning it, it looks like it, but we don't have as much evidence as we see in this clinically established. There's also a new research designation too, a possible prodromal MSA. And I think that will be important when we talk about the different presentations and pathways to MSA. From a pathologic standpoint, there is some interesting history regarding the understanding and discovery of alpha-synuclein and alpha-synucleinopathies as the cause of these disorders. So Frederick uh, Louis uh, published in his textbook on um, Louis bodies uh, in the early 20th century. And so the Louis bodies are a feature that is known in a lot of these synucleinopathy category. 
But multiple system atrophy is a bit unique in that in, in the late 1980s then, uh, this uh, pathology group published a unique um, finding the glial cytoplasmic inclusions that is seen in, in patients with multiple system atrophy. And it really separates it from these other alpha-synuclein disorders that have more of a Lewy body presence. Um, and so it's interesting to look at these original drawings from uh, Lewy and compare them then to the 1997 publication, which is really a landmark and led to uh, linking the genetics of some cause of these synucleinopathies, of which Parkinson's disease is part of, led to development of antibodies against alpha-synuclein and really showed that the abnormal protein that was accumulating in these Lewy body disorders or these gliocytoplasmic inclusions that are in MSA was alpha-synuclein. This is some work that there were a couple of groups that in the late 90s converged on alpha-synuclein and after implicating it in Lewy bodies showed that it was also involved in gliocytoplasmic inclusions or MSA. I'm going to step out a bit and, and define these synucleinopathies then. And so there's a number of shared clinical features in these disorders that are due to synuclein deposition. Patients often have REM sleep behavior disorder acting out their dreams. There's frequently autonomic dysfunction in a variety of uh, patterns uh, uh, and severity. So MSA often being some of the most severe autonomic failure. And smell can be affected too. More so in the Lewy bodies, there tends to be a reduction in smell, meaning in Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies. Whereas in patients with MSA, this is largely preserved. So I'm going to move on now and talk about the different mechanisms behind multiple system atrophy. So first, who is at risk and how is this inherited? In our North American population and our European populations, there's really no causative gene that is linked to multiple system atrophy. I'm so glad that later in this MSA series, you'll hear from Professor Soji uh, in, from Tokyo because he has found linkage of specific genes in the Japanese population, CoQ2. And so he will be, really be an expert on the cutting edge research on the genetics affecting those populations. So even though we don't have one gene that we know causes multiple system atrophy, like some of the other ataxia disorders, we, we know that there's probably a complex interaction between different genes and environmental factors. So this is from a review from Sang and colleagues, and it highlights some of the uh, genes that we know are probably related in Parkinson's disease and may also be contributing to MSA. As we talked about from the synucleinopathy umbrella, these are sort of cousin type disorders. So you can see there's a number of different genes that may be related or may lead to a susceptibility for some patients to get uh, MSA. But we also tend to, you know, we, we suspect that there is often an environmental factor or environmental trigger. So in, in some patients, it's either a high exposure of certain chemicals or pesticides um, that, that could be contributory. We haven't found that smoking necessarily is, uh, worsens MSA or causes MSA sooner. We've actually seen it, it. Patients who smoke tend to get MSA a bit later, similar to what's seen in uh, Parkinson's. And let's go to the pathology. So what is happening in the body and how does it progress? So we know that MSA is one of these alpha-synucleinopathies, so characterized by deposition of this alpha-synuclein protein. And it's characteristically as these gliocytoplasmic inclusions. So you can see up in the top panel. And that's different from these Lewy bodies that are very much circular uh, bodies that are in the neurons themselves. And so it's different. Um, like appearance of the alpha synuclein deposition, but also different populations of what's affected. So the glial cells are supportive cells of our neurons, help them to function properly. And that's affected in MSA, whereas the Lewy body actually affects the neuronal body itself. We know that um, there is a predilection to this deposition of alpha synuclein in a number of different areas in MSA and particularly centrally. 
So we see it in the central nervous system affecting uh, some areas deep in the brain, but the brain stem itself, uh, the midbrain, the pons, the medulla are very much affected in MSA. And some of these areas in the medulla, uh, such as the ventral lateral medulla, um, we know are involved in autonomic control and blood pressure. So it makes sense that uh, damage to these areas ends up causing autonomic failure and patients end up getting orthostatic hypotension because of the areas that are affected. The spinal cord is also affected too. And I'll talk about some of the signs that we see in these patients. Uh, and then kind of down in the sacral cord with the onus nucleus and how this can contribute to some of the bowel problems, some of the bladder problems that we see in our patients with MSA. We've also looked though at the different areas of this brainstem. So this is in the medulla and some of these areas are, are really affected with MSA in that there's significant loss of neurons, especially in this ventral lateral medulla. We can also see it in some of the serotonergic regions as well, like the uh, magnus, obscurus, and the pallidus, but the, the ventral lateral medulla is severely affected. And while I say, you know, we implicate alpha synuclein as kind of the cause or what's affecting things, often the amount that we see um, on pathology doesn't link exactly with the amount of neuronal loss. So there's likely a lot more going on than just this deposition of alpha synuclein alone. And that gets us into what may be happening on a molecular level, meaning what is really hurting these neurons uh, such that they're dying off and then patients get these symptoms. I really like this figure from Dr. Svenchuli and Venning, and they highlight different possible genetic factors and environmental factors that can lead to this pathogenetic pro pathogenic process. And it also shows the different players. So here we have a neuron that's degeneration, degenerating and also possible prion-like propagation. We'll talk about that in a bit. We see the, the oligodendrocytes uh, and the alpha-synuclein accumulating in them. So these oligodendrocytes, uh, these microglia, which are the supporting cells of our neurons, become affected. There comes kind of an inflammatory type process. And then with that loss of that support for those neurons, then that neuron becomes damaged and then dies off. We know that sometimes the neuron will pick up some of this alpha-synuclein too. There can be some neuronal cytoplasmic inclusion, but it is different from those Lewy bodies that we tend to see. The areas that are affected leads to the clinical syndrome. So as we're interested in ataxia today, we know that when it affects this pons and the cerebellum, we get this olivopontocerebellar atrophy or the MSAC phenotype. When it's deep in the brain, affecting the basal ganglia, we get more of the striatal nigral degeneration, leading to the Parkinsonism, and certainly involvement of that brainstem and hypothalamus leads to more of the autonomic failure. I mentioned this prion-like spread, and this is one of the most interesting things that's come out of MSA in the last uh, um, decade or so. And this was work from uh, Stan Prusner, who's won a Nobel Prize, that that prions kind of spread and prion-like behavior will grab uh, other proteins or the same protein and also contribute to this further accumulation. And so we know that this alpha-synuclein protein can do that. It misfolds, it leads to an oligomer uh, formation that can affect the supportive cells, the oligodendrocytes that lead to the gliocytoplasmic inclusion. And then we have this and a more destructive process that leads to the degenerating neuron, the activation of the microglia and the astrocytes. So that is a lot, some of the most exciting thing that I think has gone on and hopefully will help lead to different uh, treatments and ultimately uh, hopefully a cure for MSA by targeting some things in this pathway. So let's step back a bit and talk about diagnosis of MSA and specifically of MSAC. This is so important for our patients with ataxia because we know that patients who present with ataxia later in life, like after 50 or so, have a, a, are, are really highly likely to have MSA 
say then a genetic form of ataxia if there's no family history. So it's important to recognize that it, this is MSA when a patient comes in with ataxia. We do that with our clinical examination and history. We can also check that autonomic function with testing and neuroimaging is also important. It's also no, good to know this patient population. So for the most part, MSA is between 50 and 80, though we can have some um, early onset uh, MSA or young onset MSA that occurs in 30s and 40s in some patients. And there are a few patients reported that are, have it beyond 80 as well. It's about the same incidence as ALS uh, in this you know, 50 year population. And it's really the same in terms of sex differences. Men and women are both, are both similarly affected. It has a poor survival. So from the time of onset to onset of symptoms to death is usually about six to 10 years in this population, though there are a number of things that uh, may affect that survival. The key features in MSA involve motor involvement and autonomic involvement. You're all familiar with the cerebellar ataxia, so that leads to the MSA C-type or the Parkinsonism, which is the P-type. But I will say there's often a lot of connection. So um, patients may have both, and it may be even hard to sort out which is the predominant type. And typically as the disease progresses, we do tend to see more of the other uh, types. So say if someone has MSAC, is diagnosed with MSAC, I would expect that there may be some Parkinsonism that would come out throughout that disease course. Patients with MSA have to have autonomic failure. And there's varying degrees of this. Frequently it's seen as orthostatic hypotension, so a drop in blood pressure upon standing, but often there's really high blood pressures when the patients are lying flat. The genital urinary system is often affected, and it's a unique um, kind of phenotype or picture in that it's more retention. I mean, the bladder gets very large uh, and then cannot fully empty, and patients often have incontinence. Uh, there's sexual dysfunction for both men and women, and constipation can be quite problematic. But just as the name suggests, multiple system atrophy, there are a number of other symptoms that can go along with the, the motor and the autonomic. And, and this upper motor neuron syndrome highlights the spinal cord involvement. So hyperreflexia, um, spasticity. There can also be dystonia. And I'll show a picture of one, a common type, but it can affect um, multiple different areas. This anticholis is a type of dystonia where the head is forward, and we'll show a picture of that. And the, the speech changes or dysarthria is fairly unique in that it's a often has a, a kind of a spastic quality as well as the predominant motor impairment. So it could be a taxic uh, with that spastic quality. And in patients with Parkinsonism, we often give them levodopa, which is the medication which can be so helpful in patients with Parkinson's disease and gives back the body dopamine, which is down. But in our patients with MSA, we often see early and severe dyskinesias or extra movements uh, when they have, uh, when they're given uh, levodopa. There's also respiratory and sleep involvement. So strider is really important, indicating some brainstem involvement, as well as central or obstructive sleep apneas. This is another picture of some of these red flag features. Another one of the motor features is myoclonus, brief jerks that can look like a, like a tremor. And we can see these cold hands and feet that often have color changes, so purple or red. This is an upgoing toe that we see as an upper motor neuron sign, or it could be a striatal toe, like a dystonic feature uh, as well. This shows that anticholis, which is that forward projection of the head, which sometimes can lead to a chin on chest uh, type deformity. So when we see a patient with ataxia that has some of these red flag features, uh, we'd be most suspicious for multiple system atrophy. Now, just as the name suggests, there could be multiple ways that someone will get to the diagnosis of, of MSA. And we'll talk about cerebellar ataxia first.
We know that certain populations are more likely to have uh, higher percentages of MSAC, so almost 84% of our Japanese population, whereas uh, in MSAP tends to be more prominent in the North American and European populations. Now, I will say, though, that there's often a, a confluence in that even our MSAP patients do get cerebellar ataxia throughout the disease course. For MSAC, there are some uh, discrete imaging findings. This central pontine T2 hyperintensity, so in the pons, we see that cross, also known as a hot cross bun sign. We can see this in some of the other cerebellar ataxias or the SCAs as well, but we, we certainly see it in MSA. What is fairly common is this atrophy or shrinkage of the pons and a lot of atrophy of that cerebellum. We can see it in the midline, but also in the hemispheres can be affected as well. When we try and discern is this multiple system atrophy or is this a spinal cerebellar ataxia, there can be some overlap. Like we know in SCAL once, their patients can have orthostatic hypotension. It can make um, finding the, the diagnosis difficult. That's where the genetic testing would be really helpful uh, for uh, ruling out if it's one of these SCAs. SCA2 also has orthostatic hypotension, and patients may have other autonomic features too, like constipation and incontinence. And SCA3 is unique as well, is that there can be bladder symptoms, but also thermal regulation or sweating issues. And I'll talk about some of the ones that we see in MSA. And like I said, nearly all can have this hot cross bun sign. When we're trying to discern if this is MSAC versus another cause of ataxia, we can think about the uh, hereditary pattern. Um, one of the other ataxias that we might be trying to discern uh, would be uh, the old term is iloca or idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia, more common the sporadic adult onset ataxia. You can see there's a lot of overlap between these two disorders, but the progression, rapid progression tends to favor MSA. Um, also the, kind of that, that lifespan and whether there are additional features. Also the autonomic failure really points to MSAC. Another path that we can get to MSA is with Parkinsonism. The Parkinsonism in MSA typically has features of bradykinesia, rigidity, tends to be more symmetric, well, whereas in patients with Parkinson's disease, one side's more affected than the other. Also, the tremor tends to be a bit more postural and have an action component in patients with MSA, often with these kind of jerks or myoclonus. And like I said, that, that head positioning also is a clue for MSA. Patients with Parkinson's disease tend to respond to levodopa, whereas patients with, with MSA are much less likely to. The imaging features that we can see in MSA include this hyperintensity, so that white band that's outside this putamen, or uh, on this uh, different um, sequence, the gradient uh, echo, we can see this dark band kind of outlining that putamen. Another way that patients may come to MSA is with pr predominantly autonomic symptoms. These were the patients that were caused uh, Bradbury Eggleston, Shy Drager syndrome, uh, and now kind of pure autonomic failure. The autonomic involvement that we can see often involves that orthostatic hypotension I talked about, the thermal regulation or a reduction in sweating, and I'll show you some examples, but also that genital urinary dysfunction, uh, the bowels, and then the vasomotor involvement. In patients with pure autonomic failure, though, are, are a bit different from those with multiple system atrophy. Patients with PAF tend to have a peripheral involvement of alpha-synuclein, which is different from what I showed you in MSA, which is more central. All patients with PAF have this orthostatic hypotension with a tendency to pass out and often have other autonomic involvement as well. But what we know is that if a patient presents with predominantly orthostatic hypotension, uh, they are labeled or termed pure autonomic failure they may later develop um, motor or even some cognitive signs suggesting that they are progressing or phenoconverting into a different synucleinopathy, one of those being MSA. So we looked at this in our patients with pure autonomic failure. 
And of those, um, we had a, a number who stayed stable pure autonomic failure, but uh, also many that developed this motor or cognitive features. And it was about split between those that developed MSA uh, after initially starting with autonomic failure and being diagnosed with PAF versus those that ended up having dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease. And we looked at different features that could predict who in this pure autonomic failure uh, population would go on to develop MSA. And it's not surprising. So if they had some subtle motor signs like hyperreflexia or you know a bit of that incoordination suggesting ataxia, they were much more likely to go on to develop later. Um, and so these are some of the, the unique things that, that highlight the patients that that go on to have MSA. And then we can do uh, calculators then to calculate the most, you know, when we see a patient, if they have some of these features, what is the probability that they'll go on to develop MSA? So say I see a patient with, with orthostatic hypotension is diagnosed with pure autonomic failure, but I'm a bit concerned because they have hyperreflexia and upgoing toe as well. I check, norepinephrine levels, and if they're kind of within the normal range, then, then they would get a point for that. And if they have bladder involvement, like urinary incontinence, then I would be really concerned that in the future, uh, they'd have about a 98% chance that they would go on to meet the full criteria for MSA. And then you can highlight that with any of the different features that a patient may come out with. One of the ways that we diagnose patients with MSA is autonomic testing. So who should get tested and how? I'd say if there's any question that a patient may have MSA, it's worthwhile to get tested with autonomic function testing, especially if there's autonomic symptoms. We have a number of different ways that we check autonomic uh, function tests and I'll go over some of the most common. Our autonomic reflex screen does a combination and checks a variety of different things in our autonomic nervous system. We have our patients do deep breathing and we're looking at the heart rate response, which is shown here. Uh, a normal heart rate response would, would go up and down, but here this is largely flat, showing that, that the vagus nerve uh, involvement to the heart has been affected. We also have the patients perform Valsalva maneuver. This tells us more about the sympathetic or adrenergic autonomic nervous system. And when the patients perform Valsalva maneuver, we expect to see different phases or responses to their blood pressure. And if we don't see them, or if we don't see the heart rate response to that blood pressure drop, it tells us that there is uh, autonomic failure and points to the system that's involved. And then on tilt, we have patients live supine for five minutes, and then they're tilted up, and we can see what happens to the blood pressure. In this patient, there was a significant drop in blood pressure, and it stayed low for about five minutes. The patient was almost going to pass out, and so then was tilted back upwards. And there's really minimal heart rate response to that, which fits with a neurogenic cause for that orthostatic hypotension. We also can check sweating function with a QSART, quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex screen. These are the examples of a normal QSART, which shows the, the stimulation of sweat glands causes sweating that can then be measured in the inner capsule. And we can see the sweat output at all of those four sites. And we can also do a thermoregulatory sweat test. I think of this as like a, a, a little mini sauna, if you will. Patients lie on this table and go into this uh, heat chamber. There's windows and the temperature body, the oral temperature, core temperature equivalent, as well as skin temperature at a number of different sites is closely monitored and linked to the heaters that are on the ceiling. Now it's hot in this chamber up to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit and kept at a very stable humidity level of 40%. And that's where we know we can get maximal sweating uh, and, and, and monitor that uh, body temperature. Patients are covered in an indicator powder. So it's a yellow or orange powder that when it interacts with sweating turns purple. And we can quantify the amount or the percentage of the body that does or doesn't sweat. This is a patient with multiple system atrophy. You can see much of the body didn't sweat as it stayed this yellow uh, color. You can see a bit of sweating on the hands or a purple coloration on the hands and a bit on the feet. 
And that's one pattern that we tend to see in multiple system atrophy. We can also use the QSART with the TST. So the QSART is looking at the peripheral or postganglionic sweating. The TST is looking at the entire thermoregulatory axis. And so we can compare between sites uh, and find where that problem is. So for instance, if we had a patient uh, like the picture I just saw where there's absent sweating, but we did the QSWART and could tell that they were normal, then, then it tells us that the problem was in this preganglionic or central area of the thermoregulation system. And as we overlaid the areas affected with MSA, that would fit with something like MSA. Whereas if it's something that's more of a neuropathy or postganglionic, both the QSART's going to be down as well as the TST because it's not going to be able to get out and have that sweating response. So it's a pattern recognition that can tell us where this thermoregulatory damage or autonomic failure may be. And we can use that to help come to the diagnosis. Here's an example. So here's this gentleman had those QSART uh, normal in all the sites, but we can see over these areas where the QSART is, there was absent sweating. So it fits with a preganglionic or central cause of uh, autonomic failure. We've looked at our patients with MSA to say, well, what does this thermoregulatory uh, failure look like? So we know in, in a big population of uh, patients with MSA, 232 patients, um, both MSAP and MSAC patients, the um, mean, the median uh, percentage that they didn't sweat or anhydrosis was 54%. And most patients had preganglionic. Some had a little bit of a mix, some preganglionic or postganglionic, but very rarely was it all postganglionic or peripheral. And even some patients can have normal sweating too. In well, the pictures that we tend to see, a lot had you know, uh, you know, this lower body that didn't sweat or global, meaning most of the body didn't sweat. And again, we see that pattern with the preserved uh, hands and feet or acral preservation, which tends to be pretty unique to MSA. Again, that's that uh, acral preservation of sweating that we see in MSA. And we try to figure out, well, why does that happen? We know that the you know, brainstem and these sweating centers are involved, which may explain why there is absent sweating. But if you think about uh, sweating, we know there's emotional sweating and the emotional sweating tends to be over our hands, perhaps in our axilla. And so if that is um, preserved, perhaps those are different pathways that are then not affected by the alpha-synuclein deposition in MSA. Let's talk about genetic testing. So who should get tested and how? So I'm so glad that Professor Shogi will be able to talk about the CoQ2 mutation that he found in the Japanese population, but we did not see in our North American European population. And if there is any suspicion that this could be a spinal cerebellar ataxia, then ruling out those other causes is very important. This would be someone who has a family history, is presenting at an early age, or has a, a kind of more slower course and, and maybe not as severe autonomic failure as we see in MSA. So now I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about caring for patients of MSA. We do not currently have a cure, and I am hopeful that we will in the future. Um, there are a number of clinical trials that have been done looking at uh, different mechanisms, a lot of them trying to affect this alpha-synuclein um, and, and really not benefit seeing. But a lot of these clinical trials now have taken into account the information that we know about uh, alpha-synuclein and these uh, oligomers and, and how they're aggregating in a prion-like fashion. And the clinical trial targets tend to focus either alpha synuclein in the aggregation part, the neuroinflammation that it may be triggering, or tend to have a goal of neuroprotection, keeping the neuron as live or as, as healthy as possible. So you can see there's a number of different trials which are ongoing in multiple system atrophy, which makes you really excited that we are getting closer to having some treatments for our patients.
And a lot of this target is, again, on this alpha-synuclein oligomers. We're involved in a stem cell trial trying to give what we think is probably support, and this is led by Dr. Wolfgang Singer and Dr. Philip Lowe, and a number of other different mechanisms that are being looked at. But while we don't have a cure for MSA, we still need to take the best care of our patients that we can, and often this means multidisciplinary care. So I talked about all of these different multiple systems uh, or symptoms that occur in MSA. They're all happening in one patient. And that's really important because if we think about uh, these motor symptoms, as well as some of these autonomic symptoms, they can affect each other. For instance, if we have a patient who has severe orthostatic hypotension, often if that blood pressure is low, then that can worsen some of the motor features. Also, you know, we see a difference too in say someone has ataxia and, and also urinary incontinence. So now they need to get to the bathroom often quick, have urgency, otherwise they're gonna have incontinence, but the motor issues or getting to the bathroom are so problematic that then influence the autonomic symptoms. There also are some more subtle things too, like these thermoregulation uh, difficulties. Most patients don't pick up that a big percentage of their body doesn't sweat. Yet what happens is that they may be exposed to heat or a hot summer day and the body can't cool off. Well, that's gonna to lead to worsening of the orthostatic hypotension and could lead to a fall. Another thing that can happen is that treatment for these specific disorders, being the motor or the autonomic, can counteract each other. Most commonly is this levodopa or cinnamet, which is used to treat Parkinsonism and gives the body back dopamine. One of the potential side effects of, of levodopa, however, is lowering of blood pressure. It can lower just the baseline blood pressure and we think can worsen some of the orthostatic hypotension. So that can be really problematic if the primary issue that that patient is dealing with is orthostatic hypotension. So all of these symptoms are coming together in one patient. It really takes all of our different subspecialties to come together as a team. Also, a challenge that a lot of our patients with multiple system atrophy face is that a lot of these different symptoms are being um, cared for by a number of different providers. Say you have the neurologist who's doing the motor disorder. Um, perhaps you have a cardiologist who's doing orthostatic hypotension and with the constipation, you have a gastroenterologist and a urologist for the incontinence. And it gets very complicated, especially if some of the treatments are worsening each other. So that's why we are really advocates for this multidisciplinary care. And I'm really pleased to see that the MSA coalition is focusing on this as a priority and will soon be um, sponsoring MSA centers of excellence. Um, I also think it's important that these MSA centers have connections with research because I showed you all of the clinical trials which are ongoing right now, and that's even in conjunction with more uh, natural history studies or just learning more about the behavior of the disease in different patients. And so having an easy mechanism to connect our patients with the research team is also very important. So when we envisioned our MSA clinic, um, we brought a team together of all of these different specialists who have this interest in caring for patients with MSA and connected them to have you know, good communication. And we also found that our palliative medicine uh, providers are integral in the care of MSA. Now, often when someone thinks of palliative medicine, they think about hospice or cancer or things like that. But a palliative specialist has so much to offer. They really are experts in how to have the best or highest quality of life. And so often have a lot of different uh, tricks uh, and, and things they can do to really help our patients throughout the disease course. A clinic coordinator is really integral into this as in coordinating all of these different specialties as well. As a neurologist, my role in this MSA clinic is to make sure that we have the correct diagnosis. So diagnosing MSA, using those autonomic function tests in that physical exam, and also um, managing these different symptoms that come up. Um, 
neurologists may be movement disorder specialists, or they may be autonomic specialists. Some may be both, like what I specialize in. And so it may be coordinating between these different specialties. They can also assess progression and give counseling uh, regarding what to expect in the disease. And, and the neurologist really should be involved if the diagnosis is uncertain and then management really throughout the disease course. So we've talked about a, a lot in multiple system atrophy. It's important and when we think about our patients with ataxia because it's one of the most common causes of adult onset ataxia, especially later in life. And this clinical course and the path to presentation really can take multiple ways. We talked about autonomic failure, like pure autonomic failure. We talked about ataxia and a, a Parkinsonism and how often they tend to come together. We also talked about how the different areas involved in the brain are vulnerable or maybe vulnerable to this uh, disease. And as those specific neuronal populations are affected, leads to the different uh, symptom or symptomatology. And yet when we care for the, our patients with MSA, it really takes multiple specialists to try and come together and think about all of these different symptoms in the care of one patient uh, in a team uh, mechanism. So for that, I'd really like to thank you for joining today and I'll turn it back to Celeste. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuhn, for that fantastic overview of MSAC. We're gonna jump right into questions, but just as a reminder for our attendees, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are unable to unmute people uh, who are attendees. So if you've raised your hand, we aren't gonna be able to call on you. So please put your question in the Q&A window. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, so we're gonna dive right into things. Uh, so our first question is, if someone's been diagnosed with MSAC, should they be tested for MSAP? Can you have multiple kinds at once? Yeah, that's a great question. And for would you like me, okay, to um, take off the, 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 perfect. So there's not really a test before between the P and the C subtypes. It's more of a clinical determination by the neurologist to say which is the most predominant. And it can be tricky because like I said, often late in disease or maybe both ataxia and Parkinsonism. So then sometimes we go back and say, okay, how did it start? What were those first symptoms? And if it was the imbalance, uh, the, you know, in coordination, fine motor issues that are more ataxic, then we say, okay, it's probably MSAC. But to be honest, it doesn't matter that much going through because there's really not much difference in a lot of, in like survival, MSAP and MSAC are really about the same. Um, and we're gonna treat you the same. We're gonna try and treat all these symptoms as best we can. Well, that's very good to know. And then you talked a little bit about autonomic testing. Uh, we have an attendee here who had autonomic testing about a year ago. Is that something that you should be retested for every so often? Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes, that's a great question. So when or why do we do the testing? Often we do the testing uh, when we're trying to figure out the diagnosis. Um, and so if the diagnosis is secured, you may not need to have testing again. If it is somewhat in question and say it's a patient who has cerebellar ataxia, but you're a bit concerned they're going to progress into MSA, see, that would be a reason to have repeat testing. Um, sometimes the autonomic testing may be normal and the patients may still have MSAC. Um, in that case, um, we think about um, other testing that could be helpful and, and often looking at the bladder, if it's showing that retention picture that I talked about, that would go along with that diagnosis of MSAC. So I test a diagnosis uh, or to get the diagnosis. Sometimes I will test again if symptoms are really problematic and we can't, you know, using blood pressure readings or things like that manage. So we need to, to really see, okay, how high is that blood pressure lying flat? What is happening when we tilt up? That can be another reason to retest. Thanks for clarifying that. And then our next couple of questions are about how MSAC may be related or uh, made worse by other uh, different sort of disorders. Uh, so is there anything known about if COVID can make MSA worse or set off symptoms? That's a great question. And I think that, you know, COVID is still new to us in terms of what to expect. I can say that I see this in a lot of my patients and other specialists too, is that 
anything that um, you know makes people sick or you know excessive you know stress can make symptoms worse. It's probably not making the disease course go faster, but it might just be making the symptoms worse. So for instance, um, if I hear a patient's really declining quickly, like over days to weeks, I'm suspicious that something else is going on like a urinary tract infection. And then hopefully treating that, patients will get back to their baseline before. COVID is unique in that we, we still don't quite know it. You know, We know it affects the autonomic nervous system. Is it making things progress quickly? I haven't seen that so much as long as patients can recover for it, but it's a great question. Yeah, there's still a lot of unknowns, more research that needs to be done, but that's a very helpful explanation. Our next question is, is there any connection between Lyme disease and MSA? Yeah, so great, great um, question. We know that Lyme disease can cause damage to certain areas of the nervous system, but it tends to do it peripherally, like a peripheral neuropathy. So it's different than MSA that tends to be more central involvement. So I, I, they haven't um, really been firmly linked. And then another sort of connection question, is there any known correlation between MSAC and gluten ataxia? Oh, that's a great one. I, I would say not that we know of or not that we expect. And so if, say if someone has gluten ataxia, I wouldn't expect them to go on to progress to MSAC in the future. What I have had um, is a patient who we were suspicious that they had MSAC, mm -hmm. um, but with the cerebellar ataxia, we wanted make, to make sure we weren't missing something that was treatable, like a gluten ataxia yeah. where you know withdraw the, the trigger. And so I have had uh, one patient, and it's hard to make uh, assumptions with one patient who had ended up having MSA, but also had um, celiac disease mm. as well. Um, but I think it's it's hard hard to make connections. I haven't seen anything in big uh, studies connecting them. Well, thank you for sharing that anecdote, though. That's helpful. Uh, our next couple of questions about different symptoms for MSA. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that lack of sweating uh, is an issue. Uh, we have an attendee here who is asking uh, about what about a person who has the opposite sweating problem, excessive sweating? Uh, would an MSA patient ever have that trait instead of lack of sweating? That's a great question. And so this is where as an autonomic specialist, sometimes um, when a, sometimes patients come in with sweating complaints and it's hard to tell without testing whether the problem is lack of sweating or too much sweating. So there is something called compensatory hyperhidrosis. So th think about that patient that or the screen that had 54% of the body that didn't sweat. Most of the time people don't notice if they don't sweat. It's just kind of a nice, uh, you know, it's not bothersome. But the body is going to make up for the areas that don't sweat by sweating more in the areas that do. So patients are often more bothered by excessive sweating when the real cause is because half their body isn't sweating. So, so oftentimes the testing help us discern what the underlying problem may be. Okay, that's fascinating. And then our next question is, have you seen cases that do not have orthostatic hypotension yet still have been diagnosed with MSAC? Yes, and that's a great question. And that's where with the diagnostic um, categories, so you don't have to have orthostatic hypotension. The autonomic failure requirement could be from the genital urinary failure. So say in a male, erectile dysfunction plus urinary retention. So over 100 mils, uh, you know, checking in their bladder after they urinate, that would still meet the criteria. And we have had a number of patients with that. And then we have someone who is hoping to clarify if something is an autonomic uh, symptom or not, uh, but they are pursuing an ataxia diagnosis and they have laryngeal dystonia. Is that something that's autonomic or is that something different? Yeah, so that's great. So laryngeal dystonia um, can be separate on its own. It can be um, more of a movement disorder manifestation and we tend to see it more in Parkinsonism then. So it wouldn't fit for autonomic, but it but it would could go along with another motor or movement disorder. Well, thanks for clarifying that. And then we have another attendee whose son has an ataxia of unknown origin. Uh, they're still pursuing an exact diagnosis. 
uh, but has a significant bowel and bladder incontinence. And after listening to this talk is wondering if she should bring up with her neurologists that maybe they should do autonomic testing or MSAC. Could you comment a little bit on this? Absolutely. So I'm so sorry that they're going through that. And, and, and especially when there isn't a diagnosis that can be so hard to know. Um, I think that, you know, if a lot of people in my group would probably check a post void residual volume, which is looking at how much urine is still in the bladder after uh, voiding. And that can be helpful to see if it's autonomic failure. And that would be suspicious for MSA. It's very good to know. And then you mentioned a little bit during the talk, the uh, besides the Japanese population where there's been a gene identified that there's no real genetic testing uh, for MSAC, but we have uh, an attendee here who has MSAC, and he's wondering, you know, if uh, what risk his children have for developing the same condition. Is there anything known about that? Yeah, that's great. So, from what we know now, there is no risk that you are passing this down to family members, which you know can be reassuring. Um, we're still trying to figure out if there's specific combinations of genes that that may go low, you know, together and make someone at risk. But we really don't see MSA uh, for the most part being passed down in families. Thanks for clarifying that. And then we have a few people who have asked uh, a number of different questions. So I'm just going to pick one of the wordings. Uh, but could you quickly go over some of the terms that are used to uh, previously describe MSAC? that are still carrying over. Could you quickly go over that again in terms of the variety of terms that are used to describe the same condition? Absolutely. So, you know, MSA is, is really what we should use, MSAC being the subtype. Um, the previous terms for that were olivopontocerebellar atrophy, OPCA, and that really describes more of a pathologic finding. So it's it's that's the reason why it's not good to use and in, in, to describe symptoms, right? It's a pathologic finding. Um, another term was striatal nidro degeneration, which is, again, a pathologic term that's more of the Parkinsonism type. And then Shy Drager was kind of, um, I think it started as really being MSA is how it was described, but then got taken by a number of other diseases and, and, and the, the meaning really got difficult. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. And just looking at the clock here, we are at the end of our time today. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Kuhn, for coming and chatting with us today. If everyone can join me at your individual Zoom screens, uh, thanking Dr. Kuhn uh, for her expertise. And also thanks to all of you for coming here today and learning a little bit more about MSAC. Uh, we are so happy that you were able to join us. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everyone.